Good list. Um, hello, Eric. How are you? I'm great. It's very nice to be with you today. Uh, we live in strange, unprecedented times. And uh, just before we started the recording, you told me that um, you're in the in the center of the maelstrom, so to speak, where you are at the moment. Well, you know, in New York, we always like to say we're number one. And uh, in the case of the COVID uh, pandemic, not so excited about being number one um, and uh, number one in the world, I might add. Uh, but on top of that, it's just been since since the world has been upended by um, uh, the murder of an innocent man in uh, Minneapolis. It's just been it's been wild here in New York. And just this past Monday night, uh, my neighborhood, which is Chelsea, um, I'm on 20th between 8th and 9th. The neighborhood was looted, um, very much separate from the peaceful protesters. These were entirely different people, and no one yet knows exactly how it was done um, is a lot of it was coordinated particularly our neighborhood and other neighborhoods um, mm -hmm. with lookouts and cars and u-hauls it was something to watch i was awakened in the middle of the night and saw it happening on my street so new york um new yorkers like to think that you're always number one but new york the city also has a proud uh role in gay civil rights doesn't it we do, but I'm quick to point out that uh, the first organization was not founded here. It was founded in L.A. The first Pride March uh, uh, after Stonewall was not held here in New York. It was uh, Chicago on the 27th of June, 1970. New York was one day later, uh, uh -huh. June 28th, along with San Francisco and L.A. Uh, but yes, New York has a proud history, um, pre-Stonewall, post-Stonewall. Uh, but surprisingly, New York and New York City are often behind the curve in the U.S., well, those one one of the kind of things that I'm guessing that you have to fight against being um, a historian mapping uh, gay history is the fact that some historians or some fans of history won't even call your type of history social history history, will they? You know, there's yeah. there aren't necessarily knights in shining armor and uh, big old battles in Europe, etc. So how much of you telling your story is just to convince people that social history, the lives that, you know, real and ordinary people lived is, is valid for study? There's been a dramatic change since my, bo my book, Making Gay History, which was originally called Making History, because the publisher was afraid to use the word gay in the title. Mm -hmm. um, a huge shift from 1992 to today. Um, while it was considered a legitimate, legitimate area of study, um, it wasn't considered American history. My book was filed under gay studies. And I always argue that it was a legitimate part of the American civil rights story, at least the US uh, LGBTQ civil rights movement. Today, it is dramatically different. There's enormous interest in this aspect of American civil rights history. So I don't have to fight it at all. Um, I actually find that there's so, I'm in such demand and my work is in such demand that it can be mm -hmm. overwhelming. And also, um, if not shocking, it's disorienting because I'm not, I'm not used to it. I hear from students, I hear from educators, I, uh, um, uh, I hear from people, from people who train educators. And I'm now working with educators on bringing LGBTQ history, LGBTQ history into the classroom. So I have education partners at uh, an organization called History and Erased. That is absolutely thrilling. The book came first, then the podcast. So why did you feel that you needed to write the book? Um, I, in fact, I tried not to write the book. Um, I was commissioned to write the book by an editor who called me in 1988 when I was working at CBS Morning News here in New York. And um, I had to decide between a renewal of my contract and taking a leap of faith and writing a proposal. I was invited to write a proposal. I wasn't offered a book contract. I was invited to write a proposal by uh, an editor, Harper and Rowe, now Harper Collins, um, about a book, uh, for a book, an oral history of the, what he called the gay and lesbian civil rights movement. And I said, I'm not an academic. I don't know this history. Uh, mm -hmm. Why me? And he said, I want a book like, there's a famous oral historian called Studs Terkel in the US. He said, I want a book like Studs Terkel's Working, a book that regular people can read. I don't want an academic book. And he liked the way I did dialogue in my first book, which was called The Male Couple's Guide. 
Finding a Man, Making a Home, Building a Life, which was supposed to be an innocuous book, um, which was published in 88, 1988. But it turned out because nothing like it had been published before, it was a big deal. So he discovered that book and liked how I wrote dialogue. So um, I decided to take on the challenge. I was not happy at CBS. I was the only out person in the newsroom. Um, it was clear that my career would have limits there because I was gay. Mm -hmm. So I left to write the book. And the book was not, I, I was not prepared for what I needed to do. Um, there wasn't an easy timeline to find of LGBTQ history. Uh, I didn't know there was a history before 1969 and discovered there was a long history back to 1950 in the U.S., um, actually 1924 in Chicago in the U.S., and 1897 in Germany. And then I had to find the people who I discovered through my research, most of whom in the early years didn't use their real names. And this was pre-internet. Mm -hmm. So I made a lot of phone calls and wrote a lot of letters to track down the people I wanted to speak with. And then I traveled across the country and conducted the interviews. So the book came first, then yeah. the podcast, before we go into some great uh, figures from uh, from gay history. Um, wh why then the podcast? Why, why weren't you just satisfied with seeing your name, name on a book on a shelf being sold in a bookstore? I was so satisfied um, and so done with my gay work, as I called it, because I discounted my gay work, my internalized homophobia as a powerful thing. And I turned over my entire gay collection, all of my work um, from all of my gay books to the New York Public Library. But I made a, um, that was in 2008. And the agreement I made with them was that they digitized my entire collection. And they mm -hmm. took years to do that. I had no intention of going back to mine my archive. I thought that some scholar might be interested one day, which is why I used broadcast quality equipment to record the interviews in the late 80s and up to 1990, and then 10 years later for the second edition. But Fate intervened, and I like to think that the people I interviewed had something else in mind for me, that they really wanted me to tell their stories in their own voices. They weren't satisfied with seeing their words in print. I mean, this is not true, but I'm just, it's, it's, I tell myself this. I got fired from my job at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in 2015, where I was in charge of programs for people who've lost someone to suicide. It's my other area of interest. My dad killed himself when I was a child, and I wrote a book about it. And um, I was in my mid fifties. No one wanted to interview me for a job because a journalist who's in his mid fifties um, or anybody in your mid fifties, at least here in the US, it's very hard to find work. So I looked at my assets and uh, what I might do with them. And one of those key assets was my archive. And I called the New York Public Library to see where they were, if, they, if they'd yet digitized the collection and they had. Um, and then I had a series of meetings which led to an education project uh, where I was going to produce short pieces that were going to anchor uh, curriculum material, hired a producer who had worked for the BBC, who's my next door neighbor, and uh, who'd also worked for NPR, National Public Radio here in the US. And when she got down to about 15 to 18 minutes um, for each of these pieces, which were supposed to get down to six minutes or three minutes, she said, this sounds like a podcast. Um, and to make a long story short, she went to podcast school, uh, um, she was discovered by uh, Jenna Weiss Berman, who's one of the hottest podcast producers in the country. She said, what can I do to help you get this launched? Five weeks later, we launched the podcast. We'd had a grant. I had a grant for um, the educational project, spoke to my grantor and said, we'd like to do something a little different. But the agreement was I had to have something out for LGBT History Month, which was October. Mm -hmm. Sarah Birmingham went to um, uh, podcast school over uh, the end of August, early September. So five weeks later, we launched the podcast with a fully fledged website, did a season of 10 episodes. I do not recommend doing it that way. It was crazy. <laughs> I do a second podcast and uh, it's called Those Who Are There, Voices from the Holocaust for the Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. We took two years to launch that. Um, it didn't need two years, a year and a half or a year, but launching in five weeks from scratch, I don't suggest it. Let's look at, um, give us the timeline and the main characters to tell the story of um, gay history, because I like to think of myself as somebody who knows a little bit about history, but it's from a very classic Western European centric view mm -hmm. of which the big man of view of history is, is central to that. So, I know where my Napoleon fits in the timeline. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm English, so I can reel off English kings and things like that. Um, 
before we before we started talking today, I tried to remember. I tried to think who is the first gay um, historical figure that I could think of, and? and and I came up with Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. and and then the next one after that that I could definitely think of was uh, Roman Emperor Elagabalus, um, but. I start a little later. <laughs> okay. Well, th well, that's what kind of slightly surprised me when you said that, um, you know, you did Germany in the late 19th century. But, I, okay. I, when I mean, is your yeah, starting I, point and why? So I had to have a time frame. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I chose the end of World War II as the beginning of the story of the U.S., uh, gay rights movement. It wasn't called that back then. Um, it wasn't even a movement when it began. But it's when the first sustained, it was the first stirrings that led to the, found, the founding of the first sustained organization. It was a short-lived organization formed in the U.S. in 1924. So I couldn't do everything, and I had two years in which to do the work. So my frame was World War II, 1945 to 1990. Uh, the first publication for, the first magazine for lesbians was published in 1947. So it fits in there, and I included that. That was typed on an office typewriter by a woman named Lisa Ben, better known as Edith Hyde. Actually, Edith Hyde was her real name. Lisa Ben was her pseudonym. Um, but almost all the names in those early years are names you would never recognize. And they were names that I did not know until mm -hmm. I started my work. Um, the movement in the U.S. at least is made up in, uh, from most of the history of the, of the early movement up until when I finished my work in 2000. Most of the names are not famous names. They're people who uh, you would not know about, except for the fact that I got to interview them and share their story. I shared their stories in my book. In fact, many of the people were concerned that their stories would never be remembered, that their contributions, however big or small, would never be remembered. So I felt an enormous responsibility to share these stories in the book. And now I've had the opportunity to do it again in the podcast. And in fact, the podcast is far more powerful and reaches many more people in a more deeply emotional way than the book did. So um, I hear from people from all over the world who now know who Edith Ide is or Frank Kameny or Ernestine Eckstein. And, and what is it specifically about the podcast experience? Is it because the intimacy of hearing those voices in your ear as opposed to reading words on a page? I think it's hearing the voices, period, whether mm -hmm. in your ear, whether it's directly in your ear through um, earbuds or not. There's something so powerful, as you know, about the human voice. Words on a page are two-dimensional. Hearing a voice is multi-dimensional. It's far beyond three-dimensional. It touches your heart and your mind in ways that print does not. And I started out in print, so I love print. But to hear someone's voice, to hear their the inflections, their accent, the emotion, the silences, which you can't reproduce in print, mm. is so powerful. And people can go back and read the book and read the extended interviews if they want. But this is a way of introducing people to these individuals in a way that people are accustomed to consuming them now. And what makes the, the earbuds powerful, even more powerful, and amplifies the experience of hearing sound is that because of the way we're built, our brains think that that sound is coming right from the middle of our heads. And I remember the first time I experienced that as a 13-year-old in an architect's office in Puerto Rico um, this architect was a friend of my mom. They both belonged to the same, um, my mother had a guru. It's a long story, but he was a disciple and we went to visit his office and he just got a new sound system. He put these headphones on my head. I'd never experienced headphones before and put on the Paco Bell Cannon. I thought my head would explode because the sound was coming from inside my skull. So when you listen to Bayard Rustin or Ernestine Eckstein or um, Edith Eid or any of these people who I feature in the podcast and you're wearing earbuds, you're hearing them in the middle of your head. So it's incredibly intimate. Um, and because I had casual, I had conversations with people. They weren't such formal interviews. This was for a book, for an oral history. They're very intimate conversations. Um, and uh, I'm moved over and over again hearing them, even though I've heard them now many times. So you started in 2015 and you did the first series, you said. I, yeah, I got fired in 2015 and um, launched in October of 2016, yes. Okay, 2016. How many episodes do you have to date? 
Um, I have to double check, but between 75 and 80 episodes over the course of seven seasons. And is each episode a different specific um, character, person from gay history? Is it chronological? How exactly have you laid out the series? I wish I could say that we had laid it out intelligently when we started, but we didn't know we'd have more than one season. Mm. Um, so I just picked my favorites for season one. Season two, we were a little more organized, but I now don't remember. We had a theme for the second season and third um, uh, and the fourth. We had themes, but I guess they're not such great themes if I can't remember what they were. Our first season was specifically about Stonewall, and each of the episodes features one person or two people in conversation. I interviewed a mother and a son. I interviewed Marsha P. Johnson and Randy Wicker. They lived together. They were roommates, but usually just one person. And then for the Stonewall season, we did three audio documentaries. Um, so that we could cover the whole story of Stonewall, the year, the, the period leading up to Stonewall, Stonewall itself, and the year after. And then we did a live episode, uh, people reflecting back on what Stonewall was. The season we're working on now, oh, I should say the season after that, we looked at the 1970s, post-Stonewall. For this current season, which wasn't supposed to be a season either, once the pandemic hit, we decided we needed to do something. So we decided to revisit the archive. And each week, I picked an episode that I felt would be inspiring or Give, uh, create joy in some way, mm -hmm. and a new introduction and conclusion, wrapping the uh, archival audio that we presented before, and just set the situation. Here we are, week two or week three. I'm in my closet recording this episode. This is what's happening on my street. Um, we were going to do episode number 12 this Saturday for the 12th week, but given what's gone on in New York and, uh, and the US, we're taking a pause. We'll wait a week and see how things unfold. It's just all um, too overwhelming. Um, and we have nothing to say and nothing to add. And it's better that other people have things to say and add uh, in this moment. Quick question before we, we wrap this up. Sure. Obviously, you'd recommend, if people aren't aware of your podcast, to go and give it a listen. But if you had to go and recommend two other podcasts, what would they be and why? One of my favorites is The Logbooks. It's, um, it's a UK-based London podcast, also history. And I just love hearing about uh, London in the 1970s. Actually, it's not London, it's the UK. It's drawn from the logbooks of the switchboard, the gay switchboard in, um, in London. It's a wonderful podcast. I just love it. Um, another podcast I recommend is LGBTQ&A. It's contemporary. Um, my friend Jeffrey Masters does interviews with a whole range of people from the LGBTQ world. He's a terrific interviewer. Um, he does contemporary. I do old stuff. I do mostly dead people. He does live people. Um, <laughs> so I recommend I recommend those two. There, there are also plenty of other, other LGBTQ uh, podcasts, but those are just two that I listen to and recommend. Now, obviously, you're going to be part of Intelligent Speech on June the 27th, on Saturday. Um, why did you want to be part of that? And what is the presentation that you're going to be unfolding to the masses? What I love doing is introducing people to this story. Um, and what I'll be doing is sharing audio clips uh, from uh, principally uh, from the archive. So introducing people to history they, they likely don't know. Um, I love the surprise. I love how surprised people are by these stories. Um, uh, one of my favorite stories goes back to 1920 with Wendell Sayers, who was diagnosed as a homosexual at a major uh, hospital here in the US. He was 16 years old. Um, people don't know these stories. So I like to give people a taste of the history so that they then want to go dig a little deeper. A lot of people think history is boring. I thought history was boring. I couldn't imagine writing a history book. And what I love about the work I do is by hearing people's individual stories in their own voices, it really does bring history to life in a way that engages people at a profound level. And because our history has been so hidden and because so many of us grow up isolated, this history has these people have the potential to give you community, to give you a sense of pride in who you are and a roadmap for the future. They created a world that we live in now and they worked in much more challenging times than we did. And we can take their tactics and use them now um, to create the world that we would like to hand to the next generations of LGBTQ young people. Eric Marcus from Making Gay History, that was a perfect answer. We'll see you on Saturday, the 27th of June at intelligentspeechconference.com. Can't wait, look forward to seeing you then.